This episode is brought to you by Fully Gemstones. We all have connection with many different spirit animals. So I remember as a little girl getting a, a rabbit foot for good luck in oh, Brazil. I remember those, yes. So we, we already have that connection with different animals. And if the other person doesn't connect with that, that's okay. I actually trust a lot our gut instinct, yeah. a lot more than we're taught. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm Carol Walton, the voice of jewelry an author, broadcaster, and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and British Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery, for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas, and forgotten histories. So please join me as I tell sparkly tales, meeting all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. We are talking about spirit animals this morning, and I am delighted to have here, as my guests, Andrea Arare, who's an interdisciplinary practitioner in somatic and shamanic healing, and trauma-informed alternative therapist. Her background is in electrical engineering. She hones strong problem-solving skills with a keen eye for identifying patterns. And she runs retreats in Brazil and regular online moon ceremonies and is very well informed on the culture of spirit animals. And we have Diane Cordes, cool girl jeweler in London, known for her kind of rock sense in her big diamond stars. But she also has this very spiritual side and makes enamel animals on gold rings and blankets. So today we're going to talk about the symbolism of the animal kingdom, how it's been used for luck and protection, really since the beginning. Um, When you think of it, the scarab may be a dung beetle, but it has the longest pedigree of any amulet in the world. It was a popular symbol of renewal and rebirth, used more than 4,000 years ago by the ancient Egyptians. And ever since then, we've had jeweled mascots made from not just animals, but also animal body parts, wishbones, horns, teeth and claws that people have always looked to as bodyguards. Andrea, firstly, I want to ask you, what is a spirit creature? And can you tell us a bit about why we turn to it and what is the culture, uh, particularly, I think, in... Native Americans. I would say everywhere in the world is not just Native America. Mm -hmm. So shamanism is considered the oldest form of spirituality of humankind. And there are many different expressions of shamanism around the world. But why do we turn to animals? I'm going to go back to what is the definition of a practice that believes that everything contains a spirit. Everything contains wisdom and knowledge. And this is animism, which is the belief that the sun has a spirit and has knowledge and the rocks and the animals. So what all those ancient practices used to do was to refer to the skills, the abilities, the strengths or softness that the different animals had. And for that, they didn't just study the animal or analyze the animal, they embodied the animal. So the idea of wearing something that belonged to the animal before was in a way an embodiment of those characters of the animal. So is the strength, is the fierceness, is the ability to see beyond. And this idea comes to them as they're receiving the gift from the animal. So yes, uh, traditionally we wore animals, we wore symbols of animals, we draw animals because there was always a reciprocity of connection with them. We just didn't just take them, but we also gave and received from them. Wow. I know. (laughs) 
Now, you have That's to look amazing. at your animal jewels in a different way. Yeah, exactly. And maybe we've just sort of ignored that culture for some time and we've just seen them as sort of decorative, figurative pieces of jewellery. But actually, there's something more behind it. And Energy. Diane, why did you start doing animals? Well, you know, um, I always had an attraction to animals. And, of course, now we have all these rescue dogs, for example, at home. Wasn't the plan. There's five. But in any case... Um, I was very attracted, for example, to the bull or a tiger. And with my jewelry, I always tried to connect to the wearer. So I did it in the beginning with, with my amulets, through scent, but I also felt a very strong connection with animals. So I wanted to bring that in to a collection, the Animal Kingdom collection. And it's funny because I look back and I thought, how did this even come to my mind? And I remember it was, um, I was sitting in my office, it was late at night and everybody left. I had my armor rings on and I started thinking about my mother's ring. It was, it was a cougar ring and she had it in this drawer. Uh, it was her jewelry drawer. And every time she would leave the house, when I was a young kid, I would go in and I would just like pretend I was whoever, some a princess or a warrior or whatever it was, and I would play with all her jewelry. But she did have this one ring and it was a cougar. And I was so attracted to it and I would say, this is the ring I'm going to have when I get older. And you know, my mother has passed now um, for like 15 years ago and I don't know what happened to that ring. I didn't want to replicate it exactly because that was that memory and I didn't want to take that, take it away. But I took that memory, that image, and I did not do a cougar, but I designed a bull, which was still linear in design. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create the Animal Kingdom collection because this had so much, like the cougar had so many memories for me that I needed to make it my personal design. So I did the bull, the snake, the lion, and then it was the zebra. And that was the beginning of the first part of the collection. And did you think specifically what each one meant? Yeah, I mean, the bull, of course, I'm Taurus. Mm -hmm. I own the company, so guess what? I'm, <laughs> I'm, do I'm doing the one I want first, right? Okay. No, but because I'm quite stubborn. Um, actually, I didn't think I was stubborn, but people tell me I am, so I'm just going to go with it, okay? Um, so I did, I, we did the, I did the bull. And then from the bowl, I wanted to, I wanted to do four. And for some reason, I don't know why I chose four to start with this as opposed to three. So I did the bowl and then from the bowl, which was quite linear in design, I went to the zebra, which was, it still had the same uh, facial design, but then I added more details to it with the stripes. And then I wanted to incorporate something that was a little bit more fluid. So these are all enamel and diamond. Yes. On gold. Yeah. Yes. And then I put I put the snake and then I from there I, I wanted to bring one more um, animal in. So I brought in the, the lion, which also had fluidity within the, the mane. And that's how it just sort of began. Do you know it's quite interesting you chose those animals because I feel with a lot of your jewellery, you're all about, you know, you literally have these tags that say girl boss. Yeah, and it's yeah. all about the size lady of boss. lady boss. Yes, exactly. And it's all about slightly empowering. And those are very strong animals. Yes, they, they are. But, you know, I, I really, I feel that I want throughout all my jewellery, as much as I can, I want to empower women. I want to give them something. I want them to connect, right? I mean, that's what we're... What we're doing, Andrea. That's what we're doing. Yes, and it's very important. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's very, it's a bit of messaging, which is quite quiet. And no one really knows maybe what, what it's about. Like if you're sitting in a meeting and maybe you see someone wearing a bull ring or you see a lion ring and the person across from you that you're pitching her deck to maybe for a, to a VC fund, they're kind of thinking like, mm, what is she trying to say? Or, or okay, don't mess with me because she's wearing the bull or she's wearing the lion, for example, right? I mean, very tribal. Yeah, yes. yeah there you go. Yeah, it's all... That's <laughs> what warriors would do. They would wear their paratas before they go to a war, a negotiation. Or right, it, it's war. <laughs> so why is it important to be wearing the animal, Andrea? It's. I think it's a combination of how you connect with something. We... We have pictures around our house to remind us of our family members, of our ancestors. We have something in us that reminds us we are connected with the power that is not leaving us. And I believe Diane and I have been in different ways tapping into this yeah. 
big transformation that we're going through right now, which is re-empowering women yes. and bringing to them the possibility to find a power in their small daily things, lives, but noticing where we are no longer trapped into old role models. And so that would have been the original way in different cultures thousands of years ago. Also, they wanted to embody, like the hunter-gatherer would want to embody the wild animal and maybe respect the animal that it had killed because it had fed fed their people. Always, always with respect is one of the first roles of shamanism is that you don't take anything without giving something back. So even when um, the hunters go out to find uh, their lunch, dinner, they um, have a journey, they have a meditation, a vision about that. They make an offering and then they go hunt the animal and bring it back. And they give something back to the land, always with respect. But even the, the difference of places in the world, because as I said, shamanism is all over the world, you have different animals and different animals that will symbolize what you have in South America, the, the hummingbird. While in, in North America, you have the bull, the, the buffalo. There are animals that represent different things, but they all have the group of animals that will represent the soft medicine, the strength, the the uh, the healing the vision the so it it's just the the observation of the land and what is around them so you need different animals you don't just have one for your life is that what you're saying that you need different animals for diff specific things the way i learned is that you use different power animals for specific length of time in order to help you accomplish something bigger in your life is the bigger picture and you have different spirit animals that will help you with smaller tasks and things that come and go so you may work with one or a couple of, of animals that follow you for many, many months or a few years that will help you to accomplish a bigger task in life. But quite often when I'm journeying for a client or for myself, I will have different animals that will be supporting me in different ways. That's so interesting. So they kind of just come to you? You you envisage them? They come into your mind? Yes. So shamanic practitioners mm -hmm. use a journey, which is a vision to access information for healing, for food, for the next camping site. And we here, as modern people who have a food from the supermarket and have a house, we use for our personal development. So I use sounds. It's a drumming or rattle in specific frequency. And we go into a meditative state that allows us to have visions. And with this vision, there's a lot of symbolisms and the animals will come to bring a message, to bring a healing or a direction. And always an animal. The majority of the time is an animal. I have to put Andrea on the spot here because I have to say I have had a session with her. Did you see an animal with me? <laughs> Sometimes I see an animal. A lot of the times what I translate to the client is the meaning of the animal. If the animal came with a specific message. Okay. So it's less about that, oh, I just discovered an animal for you, which I do have a specific ritual to help people find their power animal and embody their power animal. But if I'm doing a healing session, which was our mm -hmm. experience, Carol, then I'm just bringing the message of the animal to you. So you don't feel so attached to the animal and specifically at the time. I see. Oh, so what, what, what animal I was know. that? What was it? Do you tell? No, it's okay. It's I okay. have <laughs> actually looked up. I did one of these um, online. You can do these little quiz guys to oh, find yes. out your spirit animal and i was a wolf oh okay really the kind of matriarch what's the matriarch you're kidding like the, oh, that's so the, 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 the person who looks after right okay i'd like to say i was the the writing animal <laughs> not a wolf <laughs> the, the, the novelist <laughs> animal but um 
I was I was the um, person who looks after. I actually oh, wow. would say that most people have a connection with the animal at some point, even if it's just naturally. Yeah. Having Diane that connection with the bull because right. both of us are Taurus. Oh, you're Taurus too. Yeah. There you go. So mm-hmm. it's either that or just having a natural connection as children with a butterfly or a, it, it. It's very common that we already have that in some point Mm -hmm. and then end up losing because we become very focused in what we have to accomplish in life. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I looked up when I was looking at my own spirit and you know to find mine and they said basically you have to go into a quiet space where you sit and sort of meditate quietly, close your eyes, set an intention to travel to find your animal and you just sort of have that, you know, like you're going in a tunnel, you're looking maybe in a forest, you see a light at the end, you step out, you walk around, see what you see, and notice the animals. And the animal that's yours will appear to you three times. That's Oh, wow, that's, that's really interesting. Wow. But isn't it, for mm. example, if you, let's say you have, you see a bunch of animals on a wall in a sketch or something, there may be one that you're just automatically attracted to. Absolutely. And that could be, you know, that's something maybe... Visually, they're just so beautiful, or there's something that you find you find an inner connection, or they just could, you know. Absolutely, it's a very individual. Yes, and this is why I I say that the way I was taught. Right. You're gonna have different spirit animals that right. will help you with different things. Right. But you have a, perhaps a power animal that is overseeing a bigger picture of something, right. and the power animal not necessarily is a deep connection, but it's that wisdom that I need at that time in order to accomplish something. Right. So you have to do this regularly then? Actually, we have to keep a relationship with the animals. It's not something that we, as a shamanic practitioner, we don't do a one-off. It's something that every time I'm working with a client, I'm also having their support to do healing. When I'm just meditating or doing something for myself, I will have a connection with that animal and I will play with that animal. I will dance with that animal and I will thank the animal for being in my life. That's so interesting. It's a relationship. Wow. That's so interesting. And I guess some of them, you look and it's kind of obvious what they mean. Something like the eagle, courageous, truth-seeking, you know, the way it's used in um, um, as uh, symbolic in the U.S., Is it in the U.S. flag? Yes, it's the bald eagle. The The bald bald eagle eagle. in the U.S. flag. You know, it's sort of, you know that it's there to embody some of these truth-seeking, courageous, full of justice um, ideas. So I suppose some are obvious, some maybe not so obvious. Right. And one of my teachers used to say that most people want a tiger as a power animal. Nobody wants the frog. (laughs) (laughs) what does a frog mean Uh, so the frog has that incredible capacity to live in water and land it's it has so um, adaptable well it's so adaptable yeah you're right exactly and then they're different i mean would that be like a menopausal animal to help people through i mean different phases of different life funny oh my gosh Well, I consider that we have multiple transitions in life, and those are rite of passage. And every time you're going through a transition in life, it's it's a transformation. And there, you're not it's not just transition itself, but it might be something that you need to let go and something that you need to learn. And usually, the animal that you feel attracted to, it has to do with. What are you about to learn, to grow, to embody for the next cycle in your life? That's cool. That's very cool, isn't it? And there we have idea that you need to know what they embody and you're wearing them to embody something. But you also want it to be an expression of style. So you want this sort of spirituality and style. Yeah. Diane, how yes. do you do that? <laughs> Hence my Animal Kingdom collection <laughs> in diamonds, 18 karat, rose gold or yellow gold. There you go. Um, how do you do that? You, look, so I, you know, I, I made the rings. It, they're very beautiful. I have to say, I'm very proud of the collection. And um, like I said, they're in 18 karat gold with diamonds, and I used either emeralds for the eyes or blue sapphires for the eyes. And, and now I've also uh, brought them into blankets, which uh, is was the expansion 
from from the jewelry into lifestyle, which is what I wanted to do. So again, the wearing capacity, the wearing, you, you yeah. wrap yourself in the animal. You know, so instead of like wearing it, let's say in a ring, but you bring it into your home and it was very seamless in doing that. So for example, you're like, I don't know, you're on the couch and you're watching a, a, a film with your girlfriend, boyfriend, lover, kids, whatever. And you take the, the zebra, which is really like, which represents creativity, communication. But then you can also wear it out, for example, and, and use, it, use it as a blanket, which is now like the latest thing which is happening, which is so funny because I wore the, um, the bull blanket out to a restaurant, this new restaurant, Notting Hill. And it was, and I, we were walking home, my daughter and I, and I cannot tell you how many people thought that they knew me because I was wearing that blanket. So they, they were, it almost was like a, like a barrier that broke down and people just felt like a connection and they were coming over. Hey, oh my gosh, that's a cool, that's a cool animal in your back. Oh, I love bulls, but guess what? Um, I love a dragonfly. I'm like, watch, well, I have a dragonfly. And it, it was, it was sort of like a conversation starter. People started just to almost started to connect. It was really interesting. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's so, such a cool uh, bull on your back. I'm like, oh, thanks. Where'd you get it? I'm like, and, and um, Alex was like, well, my mom made it. Oh, that's cool. Actually, a bull is really cool. I'm Taurus. And then the other person said, well, I'm a Leo. Do you do a lion? And I said, yes, actually, we have a lion blanket. I said, yeah, because, you know, lions are like, they have courage. And then for like 10 minutes, really, we were just standing on the street talking. And we got to know each other. And it was really cool. Oh, what do you do? And Alex is a film producer. So we're talking about that. And then this guy worked in media. And oh, my gosh. And it was just like all from the bull blanket. It was so funny. Just, it just started to connect people. It was really, it was. Do you think it's like, it's like wearing something that advertises who you are. It's sort of very, in, a, a sort of an expression of this is my character, my nature. I'm, I'm this lion. Do you think yes. that's what it is? And people think, oh, I know her because I know that lion. It's, it is, I think, yes. But I think you definitely, you open yourself up a little bit by wearing it because in one way, because you have, I don't want to say the guts, but you, you, you show other people that I'm, I'm wearing this animal. Okay, maybe not on purpose to, sh to show other people, but people, when you are wearing it, there's a way of expressing yourself. And I think that breaks down the barriers, as I said, and just, it just makes other people communicate with you easier, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you go into a Halloween party. If everybody's all dressed up at a Halloween party, think about it. You're a little bit easier to start talking to somebody. That's a good point. Right? As opposed to just everybody standing there all dressed up for a regular party. But in a Halloween party, you know, someone's dressed as a skeleton. You walk over and well, let's say they're wearing a funny hat. You know, you'll, you'll be a little bit, maybe you'll, you'll have a little conversation piece to talk about, which is their costume. It's funny, you know, so maybe that's, that also has some kind of a connection. And so I'm still not quite sure, Andrea, how we, how they guide us and how we know they're guiding us. And um, how do we know what they're saying to us? It's more about to how you feel when you embody them than that, a direct message to you. So I have a funny story when I was doing a healing session on a client and a dragon showed up. And I don't usually work with dragons because I'm from South America and we, dragon is a mythical animal and we don't have a lot to connect with. So she specifically was asking for healing for a relationship. And that dragon didn't have a specific meaning for me because it's a mythical animal, but that dragon had such a specific characteristic of the, the, the wings were slightly broken and they were atrophied and there was something very weak about that dragon. When I finished the session, I explained to her and I said, I'm kind of sorry because I'm not totally sure what a dragon is. And she said, well, the partner that I told you about has a dragon tattoo in his back that goes from his one arm, crosses the whole back and finishes in the other arm. So the meaning wasn't exactly what dragon mean, but in that case was that person, which is symbolized the dragon, has a lot of wounds in his life and he's not capable of flying like a dragon. So as you embody and you connect and you build a relationship with the animal, they are expressing to you what is the message. 
is not necessarily a word or a sentence. So there is a there is a message. But City on Our Own, and I'm not sure whether on my own I would think of a wolf. Um, no, I'm not sure what I, I would think of. When I look at you, I'll see a wolf for some I reason. Know. I think I'd think more of a sort of giraffe <laughs> or a warthog. I love yeah. giraffes, I love warthogs because of what they wrote. They're just so busy. They run, yes. around, <laughs> they run around the jungle, they're always in everybody's business. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I just sort of love that sort of action. That's so funny. Um, and that's my favorite thing about discovering something in you. So I'm more in favor of you sitting and doing the meditation instead of looking online, because I feel like the message is already inside of you. I've had what we could call a hundred different coincidences in doing sessions with clients where I would say there was a very strong presence of a um, dragonfly. And the client would say, that's my nickname, dragonfly, since I was a little girl. So I, I believe that those things are already in connection with us, already present in us. We just need to stop, make time and discover. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do have a natural attraction to a giraffe, but the animal that comes to you in meditation happens to be a wolf, great. Giraffe is always going to be a resource of grace and being busy and looking at looking above seeing ahead having that upper the higher view of things but actually wolf is here to teach you a lesson wolf is your teacher at this moment and what wolf is teaching you perhaps is how to move your family as a pack in a specific direction how as you told us the story of bringing everybody into this lovely house but this home had to be you had to build a home in here in a new house so all of this is part of the medicine that the animals teach us and do i know that how do i know what the wolf wants me to do so if i think of the wolf how do i hear the wolf basically i i would say it's obviously easier to do it the more experience you have so i love the definition you have diane of yeah. Zebra, yes. because I had clients where I knew that the definition for them was stop being so black and white. Right. You, you are in two different extremes, but can you find... And for me, because I have this practice for 30 years, is I could notice the animal was a stiff, there was a lack of grace, there was, it was a zebra, and zebras are lovely. But that one is specific at that time came up with a, a very stiff behavior. So I knew, hmm, this one, the message is find it what is the gray area, find it what is in the middle between the extremes. But I would say for a new person, find a, a soundtrack of drumming or rattle, shamanic drumming or shamanic rattle, YouTube, Spotify, internet has a lot of that. Sit and listen to that. And then try to see if an animal comes to you three times. And then you sit with the animal at different times and you notice what it's showing. Is the animal fixed looking at a house? So is the animal trying to show you something about your home? Is the animal looking busy like it's working? Is that relationship with something from your professional life and you start building what is that symbolism relating to and then we wear it as an intention to remind us of that or as a protector it can be both, both mm -hmm. i would say right yeah. Yeah. and i i specifically i mean this happened so so many times in the years that i have been doing my practice but it's no coincidence, Diane, that somebody would come and would pick exactly the lion. Right. They know they need something lioness on right. them. And I At love that moment in life, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I love how the blanket almost creates a tribe there yeah. of people who says, I feel the lion in me. I'll approach you. Or I needed that lion in yes. me. I'm gonna approach you. So I I know that this is not coincidence that we know we know how to identify from our instincts what is that energy that we're looking for and i wondered at the moment i i did write about this right after the covid pandemic and because i just sort of noticed in the jewelry world i wrote it in the financial times that 
you know, there were so many more animals. Everyone was seeking nature. Animals were taking over city spaces that were empty suddenly of humans. That's and they true. were kind of all the fish coming back in the Venetian canals yes. and animals just sort of coming into city spaces. And I wondered if if there's that feeling too, that after the pandemic, people were sort of driven more to animals, to nature, to find out what their spirit animal might be. I mean, I would think so. It was a moment for everyone. I think we'll never forget it. It was a pause. Yes. It was a pause that, like if if we were in a collective meditation state, all of us were forced to not be so busy doing, but we became busier and more entertained with being. And the calling to listen to those internal voices became louder. And we had a, you know, a level of appreciation I mean, I, I was appreciating so much more because I had time. I finally had time. And so animals were part of that, a big part of that. Yes. That's it. I remember receiving an order for um, one of my clients called and she said, listen, I really would like to order two animal rings. And I said, okay. She said, well, I have twin boys. Um, they're both Taurus, so I definitely want to, and they're going away to boarding school. So I definitely want a bull. And I said, sure. She said, and the other one, I would like a flamingo. And I'm thinking, oh, because she's very tall. She has long legs. And I said, oh, that's so sweet. Why flamingo? She said, you know, my dad used to call me his little flamingo and he's no longer alive. And I really want to keep him close to me. So, so I made a, a bespoke ring for her with a flamingo. So she's, you know, she would always have it on her right hand and the bull she had on her left hand and just sort of kept her close to him in some maybe spiritual way. The meaning of our life experiences yes. expressed into a symbolism. Yes. Exactly. And that will, in some way, we feel protect us. Because yeah. I do think that whole, you know, all your evil eyes or all that sort of level of protection that people seek, don't they? Yeah, I believe that's the, the, what we're describing right now is how we fortify our energy or how it's weakened. And the more we are in contact with our personal power, is our energy is stronger. And that protects us from other types of energy. Could you give somebody what you think their spirit animal is? Or is that too presumptuous? So I don't believe we have one spirit animal. I believe that we have a power animal, which is the oversees a bigger part of transition. But we all have connection with many different spirit animals. So it's lovely. I remember as a little girl getting a, a rabbit foot for good luck in oh, Brazil. I remember those, yes. So we we already have that connection with different animals. And if the other person doesn't connect with that, that's okay. But I don't I don't see how it's it's presumptuous to assume that the other person would be connected to that or not. Mm-hmm. I actually trust a lot our gut instinct yeah. a lot more than we're taught. And do you think to to do what you both do to to, to... Um, envisage these animals and for you to work with people sort of animal spirit guys do you think you have to be really in touch with the natural world and listening to nature's wisdom do you think you have to have that capacity I I do but I don't think that means you have to live in a jungle I think (laughs) yeah it's a jungle out there picking up from what Diane said uh, during the pandemic we could hear birds that we didn't hear before yes we we saw the color of the water changing and becoming more clear so we are blessed to live in a city in London that has so blue remember I remember the sky was so blue we didn't hear the airplanes and we heard more birds that for me is already a, a connection with nature I have a garden and I have a fig tree. And for me, a lot of my work is done with that little piece of land because I have a young child and I'm busy. So for me, it doesn't mean going out in the jungle, but sometimes even sitting in your home and connecting with what you have perceived as the animal that is supporting you, that, that's connection with connection with nature. And I wanted to know some of the animals that other people who are listening around the world the the way that you said we connect in different places with different animals mm. what are those so i was mostly referring that different locations in the world that we have mm, different animals so in south america when we connect with the animals we talk about 
the hummingbird and we have monkeys. And in North America, we we talk about we talk about the buffalo and the eagle, and so those animals don't don't cross. But we always have the same a similar group of animals that represent similar things in different areas. So because I have a cross cultural training and lineage from different teachers. I do work with different animals, but I, for example, wouldn't work with a kangaroo because I have no connection with Australia and that wouldn't, it, it doesn't have for me a representation, which it doesn't mean that if I have a client from Australia that maybe I will be seeing the kangaroo that connects to the client. You can so, still connect with it, right? Even though you don't have a... Yeah. That's correct, yeah. Like the dragon. Like I don't dragon. have a connection with the dragon. Well, that's good. Oh, yeah, that's kidding. <laughs> Although somebody did um, ask me to design a dragon animal ring. Didn't ask questions, delivered it, they loved it. That was great. Amazing. I should actually find out about that, okay? Mm. <laughs> so what I would say is inquire from your homeland. What are the animals that you can observe different characters of them, different qualities that they carry. And then just go into this meditative state where you inquire what is the animal that is available to come to you. Is there one global animal? That's a good question. Most people could connect with. Or, or the most popular even? Mm. Ooh, popular. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's a good question. Mm. I, would I think say most that... people want to be braver, don't they? Don't you think? Yeah. Don't right. I was going to say the feline. We're a lot now. Yeah, I was going to say the feline family. Yeah. It's everywhere. You may have a jaguar in South America, but you're going to have a panther or a tiger. Most places will have some kind of mm. feline that people will connect with. Well, it's quite interesting. It's not only do we think when we talk about personal expressions and wearing an animal, but all the big brands have adopted an animal as the, I mean, when you think of the panther, Cartier. Right. The lion was Chanel. Right. Van Cleef, butterfly. It, they, they all adopt something that they feel is symbolic of their brand value. That's actually a very good point. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, Carol. So maybe they are their spirit animals. Yeah. They could be, or they could be calling that as the energy that they want. So um, warriors would uh, wear bear skin before they go hunting because they want the strength of the bear. Not necessarily is a spirit animal that it's like their power animal, but they would uh, still wear and dance with the bear to call that strength before they go hunting. So it could be that those brands just wanted to embody the strength of or the characters of those animals that they chose. And then I was thinking, so Cartier make, you know, obviously amazing panthers, panthers right. sitting on vast emeralds or sapphires. Now, if it's packed with gemstones, does that lessen the guiding <laughs> <Yeah>. aspect? <laughs> makes or... it more beautiful. You want to wear it more, right? Exactly. It glistens, <laughs> right? Okay, so it doesn't lessen the, the activity of the animal. It's really the connection you yeah. have with the piece. It has mm. nothing to do with if it's a real claw from a real panther or if it's a drawing and a piece of paper is the connection that you attribute to that. Do you think it has a role now too, given climate change and people being more aware of nature and needing to protect it? Do you think any part of that comes into it? I mean, I think through, through the animals, we're, it's, we are more aware, right? Mm -hmm. We are more aware in general. And I think, that, again, going even back to the pandemic, it's all tying in, like the world has shifted so much right now yeah i mean what what do you think andrea i i totally agree with that that's the animals are are, are so present and it's helping us evolve to, with with the changing of the world i perceive that during the pandemic yeah. our ability to listen to our internal right. voice became louder and became more clear and right now the connection with the whole planet but right. the earth as in the provider of what we needed to survive to be sustained, it became deeper, it became a closer relationship. So how I described from the beginning that the animals that support me in my work, 
I build a relationship with them the same way that you would call your children or mm -hmm. your parents and you talk to your family members. I connect with them and I build a relationship with them. This is the piece that has been missing for us living in big cities to connect with the planet and know that this is not a one way. We don't just extract what we need. We must create balance and exchange. And we're sort of at one with the animals because we're all in the same boat. We we're are all animals. trying to survive and cling on to this planet. Right. And as a yeah. somatic therapist, I know that our nervous system is so similar to animals. We might have a very intellectual parts of the brain that can rationalize a thing. But at the end of the day, our survival comes from exactly the same model and structure as any animal out there. We even give parts of our brain mammalian as the mammals, the animals, and reptilian like the reptiles, because we are built based on their evolutionary uh, models. And so we're just smarter animals. And I suppose that is, I mean, I'm going to Paris next week to see all the couture collections. But I know that, say, if there'll be just incredible stones, incredibly grand necklaces and chokers. But I know if somebody, say like Bouchon, when they do a little hedgehog or something, that's the piece everyone heads to. It's like it brings out that sort of emotion. People say, oh, my God, look at that. Yes. And, and their interpretation their of the animal is what people sort of head to naturally. Right. Have you noticed any experiences with a client when they have discovered their spirit animal, that something shifts. Oh, absolutely, yes. In the 10 years that I have been doing this, my favorite story was a client who, in the healing session, she had a, a quick vision, nothing dramatic. And at the time, she was struggling with being a new mom and, and trying to move houses. And she was so confused. There were so many decisions to make. Yeah, a lot on her plate. A lot on her plate. Like all she, moms. <laughs> <laughs> she had a quick vision. Nothing uh, that, that w was like life changing, but she saw something with an owl. She, there was a presence of an owl. So we worked on the session. We closed. She was feeling just happy, but not transformed. The next day she said she woke up, she had to go out and buy. She said she found a, a, a lovely fabric that had many different owls printed on it. She hang on the living room and that stayed in her living room for many months while she made decisions about changing home. She made decisions about how to find the right um, child care for her daughter. So I don't think this is coincidence. And I know that in the years that I have been doing this, the owl brought her the wisdom and the calm right. and the, the vision to be able to make decisions with wisdom, which was what she needed at the time. Can I ask you something? So did you tell her about the owl that you saw or did she tell you about the owl? I she didn't. had no idea. You didn't tell her. I didn't tell her. And she her. just got up the next day and she was like, I need to find, find something with an owl. Yes. That's really cool. Yes. So it was, it, Wow, it came, went on like another level. I know. Wow. And this is why I've been doing this for more than 10 years. I really trust that instinct that we have. But I have a question. Why wouldn't you have told her about the, about the owl? You just, it's just something you wouldn't do or she didn't ask or you don't offer it. Why wouldn't you have not told her? I it just guess wasn't, it wasn't important. It wasn't important. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel, I knew that the owl came to bring some wisdom to her. Right. But I didn't feel that the owl was there as representing a power animal, right. something that she needed to build the relationship. I could have said, and maybe she would trust less her instinct right. of going out and connecting with the owl herself. Right. Mm -hmm. So I love that the fact that I didn't need to impose on her a relationship with the owl, but it naturally came from her, that relationship. So in fact... You can't be told your animal, you've got to find your own. You've mm, got to feel it. No, that's not correct. Mm -hmm. There, There's a specific ceremony that we can do where as a shamanic practitioner, I bring your power animal to you and I even, I even install that in your body, in your soul. 
and you have that connection with the animal. And that will be the, the animal that will oversee the big umbrella of the bigger perspectives and the bigger things that you have to accomplish in your life. Okay, but if you do that, I have a question. If you do that, okay. So then what if, you know, because sometimes you need one certain animal at a certain time in your life, yeah. right? So then if you if you do that, then let's say that you now then pretty much need to go to, I don't know, a dragonfly where it's going to be transformation. So would that what you've embedded in the soul would you would that be removed and then the uh, the other one would come in like does it stay with you after you do this like what happens in the transfer is there is another transformation that you have to take care of or can can it be um just organic and happen naturally without you having to do it again for example right so i would say because i'm here yeah being an uh, intermediary for right. people who are not necessarily shamanic practitioners. They like shamanism, they like the idea of this con- spiritual connection, yeah. but they are not. They could call the animal themselves if they were to do the practices, like I call the animal myself. Mm-hmm. So the power animal I work with, I did a ceremony and I connect, mm-hmm. I called the animal my or the animal showed up to me. Mm-hmm. But for a client who not necessarily will build the kind of relationship right. that I, I build because this is my lifestyle, yes. Yes. they will have that animal for a while. Okay. And if they don't keep the relationship, it's like a friendship that just, right. with time, it goes away. And then a new friend comes in. And and a new yeah. Fr- yeah. Exactly. Okay. So it's not, I don't see it as something Permanent. drastic. Okay. But we do believe in shamanic practices that... If somebody comes to me with depression, with illnesses, with right. something, the person may be missing a, a power animal in their lives right. to give them the strength to keep going. So I would specifically choose to overwrite whatever the person thinks that they need. And I would say, actually, today what you need is a, it's to recall your power animal or to call a power animal in your life right now. Right. Okay, cool. We need to know what our power animal is. So (laughs) definitely I am going to be doing this and I'm going to report back and tell you whether it's the wolf, the giraffe, or what I really secretly feel, the warthog. (laughs) (laughs) I have to like make that really pretty though. I have to do like a really good sketch with like lots of jewels on top. Lots of emeralds and diamonds, okay? Yeah, pretty awesome. Leave it with me, okay? (laughs) But thank you very much, and I want to hear people's stories about what they think their spirit animals are. But thank you, Andrea, for sharing that with us. Pleasure. It was really a delight to connect it with really Diane's incredible work of um, creating that in a physical form. And Diane, thank you very much. Thank you for coming and sharing this with us. Oh my gosh, it was great. It was such a great morning. Wow. We learned a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Carol, for having us. Thank you for listening. For this and other episodes of If Jewels Could Talk, please go to our website, carolwilton.com. Do share it any way you can if you've enjoyed it, and we love to have a comment and a rating. For more information on our sponsors, please go to foolygemstones.com. And do join me again in two weeks for the next jeweled nugget. Beyonce told us to put a ring on it, and we're going to be talking with the historian Beatrice Chadwell Sampson about the origins and history of the ring. And last nugget, we're up for an award at the British Podcast Awards. So we'd love to have a vote. It's on their website and it's also on our website. And thank you for listening and join me again in two weeks. Goodbye. If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Wilton is produced by Natasha Callan, music and editing by Tim Thornton, graphics by Scott Bentley, Illustration by Geordie Labanda, and you can find me on Instagram at Carol Walton. Mm-hmm.